So I, I believe that, you know, you can have a lot of content pieces, but always have an invitation for them to join your list. Okay, so you may, a lot of people may already have an email list, but you know, if it's just like five minutes of your time, think about how you're gonna nurture your subscriber, all right? Get ready to build, protect, and sell your expertise online with the Online Genius Podcast. You'll laugh, we hope you won't cry, but you'll always be informed and prepared so you can have the success you want. Here's your host, Bobby Klink. Hey, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of the Online Genius Podcast. I'm your host, Bobby Klink, and I'm really excited for today's show because we are going to be talking about a great topic and a topic that every entrepreneur who really wants to build a platform as a thought leader needs to be thinking about, and that is a content strategy and developing a content strategy for your business, but then also executing that strategy. I have to admit, this is not an area that I've been perfect. I always have great plans to do these things. And sometimes I follow through and sometimes I haven't. I'm working on it. It's something that I know I need to be better at. So I'm working on my consistency. So luckily, you're not going to have to listen to me talk about it because I am certainly not an expert about it. Instead, today's featured expert guest is Mira Kotan. And I'm sure I butchered that last name, Mira. I apologize. (laughs) No worries. Uh, Uh, Mira is a certified email marketing specialist and author of the Amazon bestseller, The One Hour Content Plan, which teaches you how to create a year's worth of content ideas in just one hour. She blogs at uh, miracaton.com, where she simplifies marketing for solopreneurs and small business owners. She's been featured on Smart Blogger, uh, Marketing Profs, YFS, Addicted to Success, and several other sites. Now, she also doesn't mention it in her bio, but she has another book called Create, which is about a blog and editorial planner. So, she is all about creating and executing your content strategy. So, she is a perfect expert to talk with us about this topic. So, welcome to the Online Genius Podcast, Mira. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. Well, now, and, and listeners, I have to tell you, Mira is actually over in Singapore. Am, am I right? Is it Singapore? Is that where you are, Mira? That's right. That's right. <laughs> so it's actually 6.30 in the morning where she is recording this right now. And so for that, I want to say thank you for getting up so early. You're and welcome. On a, and on a Saturday of all, all things, Mira. So I appreciate you being here. You're welcome. My pleasure. And I want to talk, I'm excited to talk about content strategy and creating one. But before I do that, I always like to ask my guests a little bit about themselves. And in preparing for the interview, you you told me that you never really intended to be an entrepreneur. And I think you used the term that you are an accidental solopreneur. So what did you mean by that? Yeah. So, you know, most when when we are in the marketing niche or in any entrepreneurial circle, most people say, I knew I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I knew I was going to set up my business. Uh, you know, you keep hearing those kind of things. But for me, it was it was never like that. I, I, I'm not from a family of business owners or entrepreneurs. You know, my parents never really inculcated that you need to have a business or you need to start your business. Any, any form of, it, it was never like that at all. You know, it was, uh, you know, you go to college, you get your degree, and then you go to a regular job, you go to a nine to five. So that was kind of like the the thing that was inculcated in us. It's kind of like a cultural thing as well, I guess. Business was always seen as something that was risky. It was always for other people. It was never for you. So for me, it was, I really just kind of fell into this by accident. I had my child, uh, you know, my daughter, and I wanted to, you know, have a break, be at home. And, you know, after that, I wanted to go back to work. So it was all planned out, but you know, it just never happened that way because just when I was going to um, head back to work, I kind of had like a little bit of a health scare. You know, it, it's all good now, but it kind of made me uh, step back and I had to drop the job, even though I, I went, you know, went in through, I got through the interview, I had to drop it. So I was sitting at home and, you know, I was wondering, you know, maybe this was for a reason and I was, I was meant to do something else. I'm not meant to go back to work. And I was doing a little bit of freelancing. So, you know, I wanted to write for myself. And I've always been interested in marketing and how, uh, you know, bio psychology works and all of that. So that was how, you know, my whole business started because I just started exploring concepts on my blog and then it just, you know, grew into a business. So 
yeah, it's all because of that. And that's the, the reason I call myself the accidental entrepreneur or solopreneur, because this is really not my journey in a sense and not what I was raised to do, you know? Yeah. Well, so I guess I wonder then, I assume you're happy with the choice at this point. Yeah, obviously. I mean, it's all, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's all worked out great. It, it's just that, it, you know, for me, it just, I just find it weird. You know, when people say that I, I knew I was uh, going to do this, I knew I was going to start a business. I was a kid, you know, having that, that lemonade stand and all that, but that was like, never me. That's never, that's not my story at all, but yeah. Well, it's interesting you say that and talk about your parents because uh, with me, it's slightly different. I guess I was raised in some ways to be an entrepreneur, but I was definitely not raised to be a lawyer, which I became. My father was a business owner and quite honestly, didn't really like lawyers because most of the time he thought of lawyers as the people who sued him <laughs> because of his business. <laughs> So he was he wasn't too happy but he got over it. So it's it's funny that we all have those journeys to overcome. Yeah, exactly. I do want to move now to content strategy and talk about that. So one of the things like I've heard this forever from the time that I first kind of dipped my toe in online entrepreneurship. I think it was like I think I literally became certified as an inbound marketing specialist through HubSpot as a lawyer just because I was taking the courses. And it's all about creating a content strategy. So what exactly is a content strategy in your mind? Yeah, so a content strategy is, it's just a plan, okay, for building an audience by uh, regularly putting content out there. And the main focus of that content is to turn a stranger into a customer for your business. So it's any form of content that is, you know, with the sole purpose of building a relationship with someone who totally doesn't know uh, anything about your business and taking them from a stranger right up to buying from you or doing business with you. So, the, and the thing is that content that we're talking about, it doesn't have to be via a blog. It could be in any medium, you know, like you're doing a podcast. It could be via podcasting. It could be a YouTube channel. Email is another form of um, content channel. So it doesn't matter which medium, but everything comes together to move that person from I don't know who the heck you are to I'm going to do business with you. So that exactly, that is what content marketing is about. And that is what, uh, you know, a content strategy is about. So the first part that you said in there is it's about regularly putting out content. And what does that mean to, when you say regularly? How often does it need to be? And uh, how do people judge how often they need to be creating content? Yeah, I mean, this is like, this is like a murky area because you know, we used to come, like, if you look a couple of years back, everyone used to say you need to blog every day. It has to be every single day. People used to put posts out even twice a day, you know, but things have kind of changed. You know, now we are focusing more on like long form content, content that's um, more deep and rich. So I will not stick to a number in, in this case. It really frequency is it's kind of like this invisible communication that you have with your audience. You know, is it once a week or is it twice a week? Or after a certain time, once you build a relationship with your audience, you don't necessarily just have to stick to one channel. For instance, initially when I started, I used to have, I used to blog once every week, but now I do it twice a month. And then everything else, I just focus on my email list. Okay. Which means I send regular emails. So that kind of becomes my main content focus. So it's really what you are comfortable with and what you and your audience kind of agree upon. It's, it's kind of like that invisible bond in a sense. So they're not expecting you to, you know, hey, they, they don't come and hound me and say, hey, Mira, you know, you have not published a post or anything like that because I, I do it in one content channel and then I take them into another content channel and then I build a relationship there. So it's kind of like, you know, it, it depends on what works for you. Yeah, I think that's true. I think a lot of people get hung up on it. I think the important thing though, and maybe you disagree is, just set a schedule and set a schedule that you can stick to when you first start and then you can always change it later, but just get yourself into the practice of actually doing and creating content on some kind of regular basis. Is that generally the advice you'd give to people? Yeah, that's right. I mean, especially when your brand is new, you know, you're building, a, 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 you're starting your business from scratch or you're building a personal brand from scratch, especially at the beginning, you definitely need to be consistent. Like I was really consistent at, at, at the start. And, um, you know, over time, when your business changes, you, you know, you, you have shifts, you can move your content pieces around. But when you're starting out, you want to get your brand, your brand name out there, you want to build brand awareness, it's definitely better to kind of stick to a schedule, you know, so that you get people in the door, you know, you start to build your audience. 
Yeah, I think that's that. That's what 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 I'm trying to do. That's what I struggle with. But another part of your answer when you were distri- describing the content strategy that I loved, it, and I, you don't hear a lot of people talk about this, but is that the the point of it is to turn a stranger into someone who, and you didn't say this, but essentially knows, likes, and trusts you, and then ultimately buys from you. Exactly. And, and I love yes. I love that because one thing that I found is that in some sense a sales communication becomes much easier once you have established that relationship. So I guess my question is, how do you do that? How do you go from getting someone who doesn't know you at all and then kind of walk them along the journey to ultimately become a buyer? Yeah, that's a great question. And and the thing is, I think where we all go wrong in a sense, you know, marketers and our business owners, we think that there is a timeline um, where someone goes from a stranger to uh, to buyer. You know, we think that it has to happen within you know, seven touch points or seven days or whatever. It, it doesn't work like that. And, you know, I was really reading up on this when I was trying to find out that kind of timeline for myself. You know, when does someone end up buying for me? And there really wasn't like a fixed answer. There are a couple of people, you know, on my email list who bought from me immediately, like, you know, the second day or the third day. You know, some others needed a longer period of time. And there were others who were, You know, I had this relationship with them. They were on my list for like a good year before they ended up buying anything from me. So when we think of buying, a lot of people think of it as a straight line, all right? Okay, we send them this email, this email, this email, five launch emails, and then on the eighth launch email, they're going to buy, you know, but it doesn't work that way. It's, I, I always like to think of it as this one big scribble. So they will hear from us and then they may get distracted. They may have other external triggers, you know, not necessarily related to you, you know, it could be business, family, anything else, you know, so they don't buy. And then they come back into your like content circle, they consume more of your content. And then they, they see your pitch again, or they hear about your your product again, but they still don't buy. And then, you know, it's kind of like a big thing, you know, Uh, most people, all right, and this is, I I can't remember the the, the book that I read, but they say that a a good 70 to 90% of your audience is not ready to buy immediately, okay? So you can't really hook that down to, you know, a particular timeline. And your content is the one that journeys them right through. So your content has to be kind of like that um, hand-holding thing. You have to prepare them for when they're ready to buy, so that is the whole purpose of your of your content strategy or your content marketing. You're building a relationship so that when they are in the market to buy, they come to you first and not go to your competitors or not go to someone else. So that is that should kind of be like the gold of your you know your whole content, your content strategy is to be there when they are ready to do business with you. Yeah, I think that's I think that's right, and I think your answer there is perfect because it conveys to listeners that in some sense your content strategy needs to always have a mix of different kinds of messages. I think sometimes you just need to have some educational pieces. You know, obviously you're always going to have a, maybe a little bit of um, subtext of, hey, I can help you if you have this problem, but some is educational just so you're building up no like and trust, and then some is sales so that you know, if at any given time, a portion of your audience is ready to buy, they know how to buy from you. Is that kind of how you approach it? You mix the two at all times? Yeah, that's right. Let me just make a quick point before, you know, I I talk more about the messages, uh, messaging. The thing is, right, a lot of us, when they see, you know, let's say they go through a launch, you know, they're trying to sell a product or a service and it falls through, you know, they kind of have like a dead launch. It doesn't go as well as they plan. They kind of neglect the the pool of audience that they've already built up and then they start to acquire new leads you know new leads in the sense they start to kind of start their audience from scratch and they kind of forget about all those people that they've been building a relationship with so the problem is all those people they are there they've heard you but they probably need a little bit more priming and you know like i mentioned the time could just not be right for them so just because someone doesn't buy now doesn't mean they would never buy from you. It's just that now is not a good time. So, you know, focus on the audience you have. And this is something that I always say, it's a lot more easy to work on the people you have to build a relationship with them than to start fresh from, you know, with a completely new lead or completely new person. So yeah, when you were talking about messages, I would say you need different pieces of content. And this is the, the main reason. You can't help someone who doesn't know they have a problem that needs to be solved in the first place. 
right? So that's the main thing. If let's say you have a product or a service, uh, your business, it, it helps your customer solve a particular problem. You assume, a lot of people assume that they already know what the problem is about. Okay, that's not the case. A lot of people don't even know that they have something that needs to be solved or that they're doing this wrong. So you need to actually work on that starting pieces. All right. That's what I call it by uh, awareness content. I call it awareness content because you're actually trying to open, you know, your um, target audience eyes, your target buyer's eyes and say, hey, this is this is something that you may be struggling with. You know, have you even realized? And then only then after you've done that, are they even open to hearing, you know, the rest of what you have to say? Because if they're not even convinced that they have a problem in the first place or they need something that, you know, they have something that they need help with, then every other form of content that comes after that, they're just going to switch off because you haven't done justice to that, that first bit. You know, does that make sense? Well, it does. Luckily, I don't, <laughs> I don't have that problem because I know that much of my audience doesn't realize they have a problem. So I actually... I have the opposite problem, which is that I have to spend the the vast majority of my time on awareness content. I have to wake yeah. entrepreneurs up to the notion that, yes. hey, you need to worry about your legal stuff. You need to be worrying about it now. So that's not a problem for me. But I think, I think there's a broader point, which is I sometimes forget that things that I think are obvious and simple to me – I'm not because, a simple for your audience. Right. And so I think yeah. a lot of experts have that problem. They just think yeah. that these things are obvious. So I'm glad you made that point. So we've talked a little bit about the mix of messages, but one thing that I know I hear everybody talk about and complain about when the idea of creating you know, content marketing comes up is that they just say there's no way they could possibly come up with enough ideas to actually continue to write things. And that's why I love the concept of your book, the one one hour content, is it plan or content strategy? Yes, yes, content plan. So what is the one hour content plan? And kind of walk us through, you know, the bold promise and how people can actually, you know, come up with a year's worth of content ideas in a matter of an hour. Yeah, so this is this is something that is a question that you know it's day in and day out. No, no, you no matter how many years go by, you know you will always see people you know having this issue, and you know they always say, "I don't have enough um, content ideas. I don't know what to write. I know I should have a blog for my business, but what do I share in there?" Okay, so the thing is, it you first need to drill down into what kind of transformation your business gives your ideal buyer or your ideal customer. Once you get down to the root of that, it's easier to come up with content pieces. So just imagine, you know, your audience, your ideal person is standing at one, you know, one bank of the river. You're trying to get them to cross over to the other end. That is like the complete transformation. That is what your business gives. Okay. And the little rocks that you put, that little stepping stones, that's kind of like your content. So the moment you identify the purpose of your business, how exactly you're going to help them, what exactly is the transformation you're going to you know, give them, it's easier to come up with ideas because you would know exactly how, what, where each piece of content fits in, how it helps them with that transformation. So once you have drilled down into how you help someone, try and think about the content categories, the big pieces of content categories. So for instance, if um, you know, your business is with, um, okay, let's say you have like a, you know, a, a dog grooming business, okay? So what are the main pieces of your content? It could be something like caring for your dogs or grooming them, you know, or food or something like that. So let's say these are the three main categories and you're trying to get someone to, I don't have a dog and I have no idea why I picked this example, but, but let me just go with it. So, yeah, I mean, and, and, you know, you're trying to get them to think about grooming their dog in a certain way or a certain style or whatever. Okay. And First thing is you need to think about everything that your audience needs to know to kind of become an expert uh, by themselves. So let's say you talk about grooming. Okay. So this is, you, you need to ask yourself, what do they need to know in this category? Okay. And then you break it down into subcategories. So within grooming, what are the things that they need to know? Okay. To kind of have that transformation that my business you know, gives them and then drill it down further. All right. So what exactly need, they need to know in this subcategory? And then once you do that, you would automatically know that there are so many different things that you can talk about. So the problem here is a lot of people look at it from outside. They just look, they just see this river, all right? They just see this river. Okay, my audience is here. I need to get them there, but I have no idea what to put in the middle. So once you think of your, your content strategy in terms of categories 
and subcategories, you will be able to really drill it down into what your audience needs. Now, that is just one way of coming up with content ideas. Okay, thinking about your thing, uh, content in terms of categories and subcategories, that's one way. And the second way is this is easier if you have like digital products, if you have like a service-based business, if you have packages, it's a lot easier with the second way is you think of your content in terms of, you know, that product or that offer. So how do I get them from, I don't know what this product or offer is about and, you know, to getting them to buy. So this is something we spoke about briefly, all right? You need to get them from being aware, getting interested, and then desiring that, and then finally taking action. It's kind of like that copywriting formula, AIDA, IDA. This is something that, you know, some of you may be familiar with. So it's really your content pieces take them on their journey. So awareness, like I mentioned, they have no idea what problem your offer solves. So get them aware of the problem in the first place. And then after that, build interest for that issue. Okay, so if it's, let's say, um, you know, for me, I talk about email a lot in my um, content. So get interest would be, you know, what exactly can they do? What, what problems do they have? For instance, a lot of them have list building issues. How can I raise interest is I would give them like a quick takeaway, all right? What can they do that they can implement quickly and they see results? And that's got, that is what is going to get them to trust me. And then go on to desire, all right? Desire is where they, you kind of have to make them desire or lust after your offer, your solution, okay? And then finally to action. So your different content pieces would fill in these different buckets when you're working, when you're building content around your office. So, you know, there are a few ways of doing this. So these are just, you know, two different things, two different ways to flesh out your um, content pieces via, you know, building content around your office, which you should do if you have office, Okay, or if you, you know, you just generally, you don't have an offer, but you want to build, uh, get your audience, kind of get them to, you know, think from your perspective, get, get them to know more about your business, etc. Then this is when you would drill it down into categories, subcategories, and then different content pieces. So this so roughly what, is, yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, well, I was going to, if you were still going, go ahead. I was going to ask you a question and I had some examples, but if you were still going, go ahead. Yeah, no, I mean, so this is roughly, you know, what the one hour content plan is about. So, uh, in, you know, in, in the book itself, I talk about the expert offer. The offer method is building content around your offer. The expert method is, you know, like I mentioned, drilling down into categories and subcategories. And the last bit is what I call the goal method. So this is if, you know, you're like starting from scratch. If let's say your goal is to kind of build your list to maybe, you know, 5,000 subscribers or something, then you would break down what is it, what content do I need to get there? So, you know, that is what I mean by, by the goal. So these three pieces come together and that's exactly what the one hour content plan is about. So depending on where your business is, what stage it is, you would be able to choose from one of these, you know, methods and then break down your content. So for example, and I think this is kind of in the second category, and again, I haven't flushed out all these offers, but I have a bunch of different template forms. And so let's say my some of my offers were to sell people these forms with instructions on how to complete them. So one way to come up with content would be, for example, to think through, okay, let's figure out five different blog posts I could write about problems you face if you don't have document X in place. And then I talk about it and say, okay, so how you need to solve that is you have, you know, you put this document, this agreement, et cetera, into place. And then I assume you would, would you have a call to action that says, and if you want to grab a, a, a template, I've got one of those, or do you not even make that call to action at the end? Um, yeah, you, I mean, you, you could do that. It, it's kind of like what I would say, it's a soft sell. So, okay, the thing is, what I usually do is I, I wouldn't link them, the call to action, I wouldn't link them directly to, to your sales page, you know, to get to buy those templates. I would rather get them in the door into my email list because, okay, you are putting all these pieces of content on your blog, which is out of your, okay, your email list is kind of like this inner category, it's kind of like this inner circle because they've given you permission to contact them. So they've taken that first step. But, you know, everyone else who comes to your blog is still on the outside, okay? So I kind of think of it in terms of circles, you know, inner circles. So the, the outermost ring is, is like your blog, all right? Uh, or wherever you, you know, it could be a YouTube channel. It could also be like this podcast. And so let's say you give a call to action right at the end of this podcast to opt in for something. That is when if they opt in, they take one step closer and then they go into, you know, becoming an email subscriber. So what I would do is, Rather than send them to a sales page, because this is 
to me, it's still traffic or that is still not very warm. You know, it's still kind of cold. So you want to, you rather give them like a little bit of a, like a soft sell, like a tiny piece of template from your, your, your huge template pack or something like that. And say, if you need this, you know, it's going to help you with this, then just opt in for that. So once they've opted in for that, they're one step in. Okay. So if you ask me, that should be your call to action on your blog post. And once you have them on your email list, you can send different pieces of content to prime them. And now that traffic, when you send that traffic to your sales page is going to convert a lot, lot better than sending that call to action on your blog post. Yeah, that makes sense. I guess I was, I I had in mind, and that's definitely the approach I've taken with, with, respect to kind of the the bigger pieces so courses and things like that i just wasn't sure if you know for example a lot of the content that i create is obviously awareness about hey here's this problem and here's what you need to do and a lot of what you need to do is create forms or create agreements and so i was wondering if if there should be in some sense a direct hey and you know if you you know we can help you with that if you need it maybe that's just in your author page so that people know they can reach out if they need that type of help from you the, the, the thing is, I, I think it really comes down to the offer. You know, is it something that's low risk or something that would need a longer nurture, uh, a nurture process or nurture period? So, you know, it kind of comes back to price points in a sense. So if you have something that is depending on your, your clientele and your audience, right? So for, for some audiences, anything above 200 is like a huge amount. And for some people, it's not. So depending on, you know, how low risk the offer is, how long a nurture period it would need, if it's something that is, kind of inexpensive, less than 100, you know, or or less than 50. Like you mentioned, you could just have the call to action on your blog post, you know, you can go and get that. But if something that is a bigger price item that would need a longer nurture period, you'd rather get them on your list first and then, you know, build that uh, nurture out before sending them to the sales page. Yeah, I think that's all really great advice. And I think that that leads into the next kind of series of questions I wanted to ask, which is one of the things that I've heard marketing folks talk about, and I think you mentioned this in, before the call, is the concept of the customer's journey. Can you explain what is the customer's journey and how does that fit in with your content plan? Yeah, um, it kind of goes back to what we were talking about. Like the customer's journey is, you know, it's it's not in like a linear line. You know, no one comes to your site, buys, you know, uh, immediately buys. And then, you know, no one t- turns from like a, a stranger to a buyer all in a single day. And there are varying factors that determine when exactly they're going to become a, a, a buyer or a customer. So this is kind of like a journey because they, they go all over the place in a sense. You know, it's it's not in a straight line. So they may hear, like, for instance, someone might be, you know, listening to this podcast and they may think, okay, you know, yeah, the, oh, okay, he mentioned these templates. I, I need to get them. But they may forget about it, all right? It, it could just be at the back of their head. And then they may go somewhere else. Maybe they see one of your um, your content on Google Plus or LinkedIn or something like that. And then they click back into your site. And then, you know, some people may... Uh, go ahead and, you know, act on your call to action. They may opt in. Some people may not. So those who opt in, you know, that's great. So that's when they are on your um, email list. And then that's when they get your other pieces of content. This could be like a welcome email sequence, you know, a nurture sequence. Okay. And then let's say you are having a flash sale on your templates or you are promoting your template pack. They may still not be ready to buy. You know, they could possibly buy maybe on only on the second or third time you have it on promotion or you launch it. Okay, so this is kind of like the uh, like the customer's journey because there are you know a lot of people would be in on the same spectrum but in different places. So someone could be at the start, someone could be at the end. So that's the reason why you need to have content that supports each of these different people wherever they are on the journey. So let's say you have people at the very beginning, then yeah, obviously you need to have content, you know, like you mentioned, awareness, stuff like that. But there are people who are already on your email list. So they have taken one step in. So you need to have like a nurture sequence or a welcome email sequence that handholds them through that process. Okay. And then those who are towards the end, you need to have more uh, uh, emails or, you know, some form of support that shows them the after, right? This is what, this is how it's going to be after you get the templates, how easy it's going to be is just plug and play. You know, you need those kind of templates. So this is kind of like the journey. You have people, you know, standing at different ends of, you know, the same spectrum, but the the purpose is to always get them from one end to the other. 
Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's a perfect way to explain it. And that kind of leads me to the next area I wanted to talk about, which is, so once you've come up with the concept of, Hey, here's, here's content I want to create and understand what your customer's journey is. The next piece is kind of mapping out a plan and putting it down on a calendar. And I, I know that I have an understanding of what an editorial calendar is, but I actually think a lot of entrepreneurs don't. In fact, I was in a, a, a Facebook group with a bunch of entrepreneurs, or I'm an active member in it, and just earlier this week, someone was asking, what is an editorial calendar? We're just trying to understand the concept. So can you kind of start with that and tell us what is an editorial calendar and how do you use it as part of your content strategy? Sure. So, okay, an editorial calendar is really simple. It's it's basically telling you what piece of content, you know, when is it supposed to be published? And uh, if you really go deep into an editorial calendar, you could also have the goals of that particular content piece. What is the aim of that piece of content? So it's it's kind of like, it's really just like a normal calendar as you would, you know, schedule your appointments, schedule your meetings. It is a calendar to schedule, you know, your content pieces. Okay. And um, how are you going to layer them out? How are you going to structure your calendar? Now that is, you know, that's where, that's the beauty of it. All right. So the thing is, the easiest way obviously is to work around your uh, marketing goals or, you know, your marketing campaign. So let's say for um, the month of February, you want to push out this particular offer, then, you know, your entire Jan and Feb should be based on this particular goal because that's your that's your marketing goal and your content has to handhold, you know, it has to work together with your um, your goals because, you know, if it doesn't, then there's no point in pushing out um, content at all. And, and this is what I say, the, the content that you put out there has to help you grow your business. It helps to, has to help you make money in a sense, all right? So every piece of content has to do that work. And if it's just there as a filler, then there really is no point. So that is why I always recommend flashing out your content pieces based on your marketing goals. So like I mentioned, if it's Jan Feb, pushing out an offer, then you know, work out through your customer's journey, you know, awareness to desire to attention, what kind of pieces would I need? And then put it down, you know, put it down in your calendar, you know, four weeks in Jan, uh, Jan, four weeks in Feb. Okay, that's one way of doing it based around your offers. Another way of doing it is, you know, important dates. For instance, like January or December, this is when, you know, people are setting New Year's resolutions. This is like a very, very ripe period for like the fitness industry, the fitness niche, anyone in personal development this period is, you know, like, like really hot. So depending on what you have planned, you know, maybe you have, even if it's like a physical business, even if it's like, you know, uh, you know, the gym, gym packages is when people signed up for gym packages and stuff like that. If you have like a blog for your business. So this is when you need to be talking about um, New Year's resolutions and why they need to feel good about themselves, lose that weight, whatever. All right. So that's when you have a date and then you are, Fixing your content around the date so that it complements your marketing goals. So it, it's pretty much that. The thing is, you have already done the heavy lifting once you have fleshed out your content pieces. Okay, with let's say something like the one hour content plan. Let's say you sat down and you fleshed out the content pieces based on you know the awareness, the desire, attention, the based on the journey, then it's really simple into just filling it in a particular calendar. But the thing is, you need to make sure that there is a reason for that content piece to be, for instance, if like today is, you know, February 16th, there is a reason for me to put that down on February 16th, because maybe in March uh, the 1st, I'm going to have like a flash sale or promotion. So this content piece right here is going to help get more people to take action on that flash sale or promotion I'm having. So that is how you need to make sure, you know, that everything gels, everything flows. So every piece of content needs to have a purpose for being there on that calendar. So that I'm guessing the first step is to map out what your promotions calendar is. And then from there, you can map out what your content pieces are and kind of where they fit in and plug them into the calendar. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, it, it depends on, on the business you have, you know, like for me, it's pretty much built around the type of offers that I'm going to have or I'm going to promote for the months. For others, it could be, you know, it could be different, you know, it could, yeah. So depending on that, you know, map out your, uh, yeah, like your promotion schedule and make sure you have a goal for the promotion. You know, what exactly is your aim? Because, uh, you know, with a lot of businesses, it's not necessarily I need to get this many leads or I need to sell this many things. It could be others, you know, it could be, um, 
building awareness in itself, it could be a goal for your marketing campaign. All right. So based on what that goal would be, you would map that out. Okay. I, I think that's great advice. Now, how far out should people go in their, their planning? Should we be going out a full year, six months, three months? How far out should we generally have kind of our content mapped out? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I would generally recommend six months because, you know, you would be able to repeat a, a couple of campaigns for the next half of the year. Anything that doesn't work, you could throw it out. Uh, so it gives you that flexibility. All right. And, you know, you you would need to kind of shift and uh, maneuver your business for the second half based on how the first half went. So, you know, it's always six months is is like a good gauge. It gives you that, that, that room, you know, that little bit of space to move. Great. That's good. That means I don't have to do 12 months. That makes me happy. <laughs> yeah. I do, I, do have some, I do have work to do if I have to <laughs> schedule six months. So I'm, I'm going to work on that. Uh, yeah. You've great, given some great advice. And I'm an analytical guy. I like to take deep dives. I like to read a lot of books. So for example, when I was working on copywriting, I, I think I bought seven or eight books and just started reading them. So I always like to ask my guests if they have a recommendation or recommendations for books. Now, obviously, you've got a couple of great books on content strategy and people should grab those. But other than those, do you have any recommendations for resources, whether it's a book or something else that can help people really get a good grasp on developing and executing a content strategy? Yeah, I would say I started off reading the, I'm just turning and looking at my shelf to see what books I have. And I think it's by Joe Polizzi. I don't know if that's how I pronounce his name. He has a book called the um, Epic Content Marketing. So that is like, it's, it's kind of a few years old, but a lot of it is still relevant. So that is like one book. If, if you're like brand new, you know, you, you have no idea what's a content strategy, what's a content plan. So I would start with that first. That, yeah, there are a lot of great books, but yeah, this is one, one that you should read. Another one is, what is that? I think it's the 8020 sales letter or something like that. Yeah. So it's, yeah, yeah. It's by Perry Marshall, the 8020 sales letter. So um, that is, I'm, I'm, you know, halfway through that book and it kind of shows you, you know, what kind of, you know, how to actually draft a sales message. So it also goes into a little bit of psychology, how to understand your ideal um, customer, ideal reader, you know, it goes into things like that. So yeah, these are, these, these are the two books off the top of my head. Yeah, I think those are great books. I've definitely heard of both of them and heard both the authors are, are well-known people. So I think that's great advice. Now, one last question, and this is one I, I like to ask all my guests, and that's, I like to think of things in, in small chunks that people can do in small tasks. So what could a listener do, say, in five minutes a day or something they could accomplish by the end of the week? to really build their business? If you can give them one piece of advice kind of under those parameters, what would it be? Okay. Wow. Okay. I'm like a huge um, advocate of email marketing and I talk a lot about that. So I, I believe that, you know, you can have a lot of content pieces, but always have an invitation for them to join your list. Okay. So you may, a lot of people may already have an email list, but you know, if it's just like five minutes of your time, think about, how you're going to nurture your subscriber, all right? You know, I, could you just put in place maybe three emails or five emails, three to five emails that kind of lead them into a nurture sequence, okay? So if there's just one thing you could do, you know, that is something that I see a lot of businesses, they don't have any form of nurture sequence once you get someone in the door. So that would be like my one piece of advice. I think that's good advice. And it's interesting. That's not something anyone else has said, but I definitely think people should do it. And there are a lot of great resources and listeners. If you don't know what a nurture sequence is, you know, I, I just Google it and you'll find lots of references. There's different ways to do it. But um, basically the concept is you kind of help people understand who you are, what you do and, and how you can help them. And you do it in a kind of a soft sale way. You don't uh, sell them hard, but uh, you give them that information. So Mira, I'm glad that you said that. So, you know, that's some great advice. Now, Mira, I, I want to thank you for being on the show. And my question, my last thing I want to ask you is how can listeners get in touch with you? Okay. So you can find me at uh, mirakotan.com. But, you know, the best way is, you know, to just really dive into the topics you mentioned here. It would be to just go grab the my book, The One Hour Content Plan, 
or you know just come to my site uh, mirakotan.com and i've got you know plenty of resources that talk about um content marketing as well as email marketing so yeah that that would be it and if you have any questions about you know this session that we did just tweet me i am uh, you know at mirakotan uh, at on twitter and you know yeah we we could just have a conversation all about content Thank you, Mira. I think that's great. And listeners, we will have links to all of that in the show notes. So you'll be able to see that. And that's it for now, Mira. Thank you for being on the show. And listeners, stay tuned for the quick legal lesson after the break. And now for today's legal lesson. Yay! Hey, everybody. That was a really great interview with Mira, and I love the information she gave us. It was also really cool of her to come on uh, with me and record that at whatever it was, 6.30, 7.30 in the morning for her in Singapore. So that was pretty awesome of her. And there were a lot of good nuggets. And if you take what she taught you and execute, you will be a long way towards having a successful content strategy, which can set you up for success. Now, In today's legal lesson, I'm going to talk about a couple of issues related to copyright law. And the reason I'm going to talk about copyright law is because this is the area that comes into play when you're creating your content. So I'm going to talk about a couple of pieces here. First, I'm going to talk about and address an issue that I hear come up over and over again from entrepreneurs. And that is what do they need to do to protect the content they create? And then the second I'm going to address is another question, which is how close is too close to someone else's content? I get that question a lot. And so I'm going to address those two pieces of information in today's legal lesson. So first, let's dig into the first piece, which is actually the question that I get asked probably the most, which is how do I protect my content? Entrepreneurs ask me this day in and day out. When I'm in Facebook groups, I get asked this question and it's just a constant refrain that I hear from people. The good news is you don't have to do anything to protect the creative content you're putting out there. And what do I mean by that? Well, copyright law and copyright protection is automatic. The minute you finish your work, whatever it is, if it's a blog post, if it's a anything else, a lead magnet, whatever, the minute you finish it, it gets copyright protection as a matter of law. And that is one of the greatest things. So you don't have to take any further steps. You get the protection automatically. Now, You can go a step further. Here in the U.S., you can register a copyright for a work. It's a relatively simple and easy process. You pay $55, I think, is the the current price to the copyright office. And you might, you know, I would advise you probably to find an online service that can help you do it because you want to make sure you get all your ducks in a row. But if you think about it, you're probably not going to do that for every blog post. I mean, why would you want to spend $55 for every blog post to get uh, it registered? So you're going to have to pick and choose even as you grow. And what registering it does is really all about getting you protection if you ever have a dispute. It doesn't give you anything. I mean, it allows you to put that it's a registered mark and, and things like that, but there's no need to do that. The only thing it gets you is if someone later takes your content that is infringing it, either steals it directly or takes it and and basically just copies it with minor changes without uh, changing the substance enough, you would have extra rights if you have registered it. Now, if that happened and you had not registered it, you would have to register the work at that point to be able to sue. And you can always do that. But having registered it at the beginning, or at least before someone has stolen it, copied it, etc., does get you some added benefits. It, for example, means that you might get what are called statutory damages. And that means you're not going to have to prove what you actually lost in dollars and cents to get something at the end of the day. But what I want to tell you is judges aren't going to just give you big statutory damages for nothing. That's kind of discretionary. So the judges generally don't give huge awards there anyway. But it gives you some other protections. You might be able to uh, get attorney's fees and some other things like that in a lawsuit. Now, given that it's only going to come up if you find yourself in a dispute, you need to be judicious about it. You don't want to just start spending $55 for every piece of art 
sorry, every piece of content you create. If you did that and you're following Mira's suggestion or any other online marketers, you're going to have a pretty big bill at the end of the year for your copyright. So you don't want to do that because you've got better uses for that money. So you want to pick and choose. Most people will copyright any major work. So if you have a book, almost everyone's going to take the time to copyright that. If you have a signature course, you might want to think about copywriting that so that you know I've had a signature course. I've never taken the time to copyright it or register the copyright for it. But part of that is I don't have to worry about someone else taking my legal course and repackaging it because they would have to be a lawyer themselves or otherwise, why would anyone else, you know, want to purchase it for them? So, you know, I make that decision, but I think people will often do that. If you have a piece of art or things like that, it might be worth doing. So that's a decision you have to make. It's a cost-benefit analysis. But what I would tell you is I wouldn't spend too much time if I were you worrying about that because you're going to get some protection automatically. And so really it's just do you want that added layer if you're going to have a dispute down the line. So that's the first issue. How do you protect it? You're going to get the protection automatically. The second piece is how do you make sure that you're not stepping on someone else's copyright? Now, in the past, talked about images, and you can find lots of resources from me about how to handle images, because that's a common issue too. And you need to make sure you're getting images that you're allowed to use, that you're getting music that you're allowed to use, etc. But what I want to talk about today is a more nuanced question. And that's the question of how close is too close when you're looking at, for example, a blog post. And the reason we have to ask this is if you think about it, we've all heard the idea that, you know, you want to model things from other people. You, you'll you go out and get ideas from other people. Often people look at someone else's website and say, hey, I love this website and I'm going to try to recreate something like this on my own website. And that's a reasonable thing to do. As a general matter, when you're doing that, what you want to do is model the structure, but not the content. And that would be true even for a blog post. So let's say you're trying to get inspiration for a blog post about the 10 tips you need to know to be a better online marketer. Well, you're probably maybe going to go and find some, you know, other people who've posted other tips and say, okay, which ones do I like the most? That's fine. Getting ideas, getting inspiration for the content is fine. The problem would be if you go and say, oh, well, this person had these 10 tips. I'm going to use those exact same ones. And then using those exact same ones and keeping the wording pretty similar, you're engaging in copyright infringement. Now, if you change it up completely and don't do those things, it's going to be tough to prove. But if you are expressing the same thought in basically the same way as them, that's not allowed. So the idea is get some inspiration. And so again, if you're your 10 tips, you also can't, for example, take 10 tips, say I'm going to take three from this person, three from this person and four from this person and use them almost verbatim for how those people set them out. That's also not allowed. You can't do that if you're being exact. But what you can do is say, oh, I like that idea. I like that concept. Okay, I'm going to use that concept. That's something people need to know. But rewrite it, reword it. Use your own words, not their words to express that tip. And again, if you're an online marketer, you should have this knowledge. So you should be able to put it into your words. So you know, if you follow me for any length of time, for example, what you'll find is that I tend to refer to not legal issues, but legal stuff. I say online entrepreneurs need to deal with their legal stuff. So that's kind of an obvious example. Well, you know, if I were getting inspiration from someone else and they were using much more formal language, I'm never going to use that formal language. I'm going to use the colloquial legal stuff that I use and things like that. So you need to put it into your own words. Now, I'm sorry that I can't give you some kind of direct answer to this because there isn't a direct answer. I can't tell you, well, if, you know, 85% of the words are the same, you're in trouble. There's not any formula like that for copyright infringement. It's more of kind of a, a, you have to look at it and see, well, how close is it? And there's an old expression. It's, It's not from copyright, but it really applies here, which is you know it when you see it. And so you have to be careful. But the advice I would give is is just 
don't start by copying something and trying to reword it. Meaning don't go to somebody's blog post, highlight the information, copy it, paste it into a document, and then start rewording it. If you do that, you're probably going to be too close and you're going to be potentially guilty of copyright infringement. Instead, go get the idea, but always start the writing from, in a sense, a blank page for yourself. And when you do that, you know, is there a chance that you're going to use some of the language? Sure. But as long as you're not, you know, doing a, you know, you know, highlight, copy, save and, and, and paste, it shouldn't be something where you're going to end up so close that it's a problem. So that's the advice I have for you on that piece. So again, today's legal lesson. First point, how do you get protection for your content? Well, you get it automatically, but you can also register it if you want to, to get some added benefits if you're ever in a lawsuit. And second of all, how do you avoid stepping on someone else's rights? And that is you model their structure, you take ideas, but you don't take content. You write it yourself. You put it in your own words. And again, the strongest piece of advice I can give is don't copy and then try to reword. Simply start with a blank page and type your own message. And if you do that, you shouldn't have a problem. That's it for this week. Uh, we'll, we've got another great episode coming in next week, so I hope you will stick around for that. Also, uh, in addition to my standard sign-off now, I have a Facebook group called Legal Secrets for Online Entrepreneurs. And if you'd like to join that group, I'm going to have a link in the show notes, but you can just go onto Facebook and search groups and search Legal Secrets for Online Entrepreneurs, or you can go to my Clink LLC Facebook page and it's linked to that. So you should be able to find it. I give uh, free trainings and, and, and other information in that group if you'd like to get some more information and kind of take your knowledge to the next level. But until next week, this is Bobby Clank signing off. Thanks for listening. And remember to visit mistakes.youronlinegenius.com to get your essential guide to the four legal mistakes that can doom your business and how to avoid them. Join us next week for another episode to expand your online genius and your success.